segment of uh, Big Bang Theory House BTS vlogs. Once again, we were outside uh, doing our observation. That's going to be a constant for now, for the next uh, four years, because the project is now the project is now ongoing. It's now on a regular basis. So, anyways, time and date stamp. It is uh, just about three hours and fifty minutes into the day of uh, Thursday, September twenty second, two thousand sixteen. Yeah, uh, it's been a long night. I didn't expect to be out here this long. Usually, uh, 2 o'clock, everything's done. Uh, sometimes it's an early night. Uh, and it was Wednesday night, I wasn't out here doing anything. So, uh, it's been a, a, a bizarre situation that the the way the, uh, the patterns, uh, uh, in terms of what I'm observing, show up on the satellite. Uh, show no real degree of consist consistent consistency. In other words, the patterns appear, they break down, they form, and there seems to be a loose pattern rather than a more solid pattern than there was than there was before than there was in prior years. And usually, yeah, you'd, you'd have this sort of that, that that steady path all the way up to uh, from from the tropics all, uh, all the way up to. Uh, to Greenland, or you know, right off, the, right off the coast of Baffin Island. I mean, that's where it's heading. So, you know, take a diagonal, take you know, take, do a pinpoint on Mexico, do a line to to, to Baffin Island, uh, Green, uh, Greenland. It goes right through Ontario, <laughs> right through Toronto. Uh, we're on that line there, and there was a consistency in. Uh, the steady stream of moisture material going up to the Arctic. Uh, that has actually broken down. Uh, it's not there the way it was before. It ref it's now weakened to a, to a point where it's uh, um, it sometimes throws stuff up, but not consistently. I mean, that's what we're experiencing. I mean, now we're experiencing some bit of, uh, uh, of injection from the south, but it's not that much of an injection. It's actually uh, a system that came from Alaska, uh, dipped a little bit south, and then came in off the coast of uh, of California, just with the northern tip of California, not near the south. Uh, so it comes in that Midwest that, that latitude there. Take the United States here like this. Here's Washington up here, and here's uh, uh, California down here. And it's coming in just about that, you know, the midpoint there. Uh, that's where a lot of the moisture kind of seeps in. It goes over the Rocky Mountains, and then you see this huge swath of uh, a material debris coming in. Uh, well, not with uh, uh, moisture, anyways, coming in and then blossoming into these massive storms. But the thing is, they go; they don't come directly to Ontario. It ends up going around Ontario, Lake Ontario, into more of the areas of uh, uh, Lake Superior and Lake uh, Lake Huron. Uh, and, and over us, and every time it tries to come back down uh, towards Lake Ontario, something's there around Lake Ontario that a few miles off, it just the storm starts um, literally being torn apart. You can see the energy energy is just, just being dragged out of it. It's like like someone takes a there's a hot thing there, and then there's a you, you hook up a hose or something that drains the hot the hotness the heat out of it. And you just see the energy dissipate, and that's ex that's what we see as the as these systems approach uh, Lake Ontario. The systems dissipate, and as I'm watching up here, we've got high level clouds because you've got a system to the east, and you've got a system to the northwest, right? So so 
uh, south, east, northwest. The systems are kind of squeezing like this. And you would expect the pressure to rise. The pressure has risen. Uh, you would expect a uh, high layer of moisture, and even though there are no visible clouds, uh, the stars are, are gone, but the moon is still up, and they don't see any haze around the moon. So, uh, this, te this tells you that it's, it's kind of a, uh, a bizarre situation in terms of uh, uh, how the clouds are sort of situating themselves at a very high level. Um, the, uh, it, because the uh, meteorology reports the uh, weather channels only report um, on visible weather. They don't go into the... Uh, oh. They don't follow the moisture. They don't follow the water vapor and the th 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 and sort of the thermal imaging. They concentrate on the, uh, uh, the visible. Uh, they're not reporting clouds. But yet, yeah, I look at the, sk at the sky, and last night there were some stars. And the same thing with the night before, there were some stars. You could see, see stars, and you could see them dancing around a little bit because there was a, you could see there was a high layer of, uh, of uh, clouds up there. Now, uh, you look out, there are, there's almost no visibility of stars. But the thing is, I would expect that there would be maybe uh, some haze around the moon, but there's no haze around the moon, so... Uh, it might be a type of uh, moisture that, well, does block the stars, which are a smaller point for, for something that's larger. It uh, acts like a lens and comes through very clearly. So uh, <laughs> these are sort of things I have to sort of sit down and take a more, uh, more uh, in-depth look at and sort of define uh, what the different occurrences are better. And that's sort of thing. This is sort of. I have, to, I have to go back into some of my textbooks, some of the uh, the physics of this, uh, sort of the physics of uh, it's basically lensing. It's it's, it's it's optics because basically light is trans the, the light is transmitted. It's projected through the water drops. So if you're an astronomer, you know this that uh, you build your observatory, you build the observatory on the mountain because you want to get a, 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 a you want to get above the water vapor level. Uh, so that's the thing is you want to get above that layer that the layer of moisture. And so you put your telescopes on top so you don't have to worry about the issues of seeing. But the thing is, is that even on the mountaintops, there, are, there is higher layers of moisture that you're not above and that you have to deal with. And this is what they talk, they talk about when they talk about uh, starlight twinkling. And uh, there are various tel telescopes now that have sat down, they've figured out, they've been able to calculate the, the, how to move the mirror and readjust the mirror using interferometry in inter <laughs> I better not say any hard words now because it's too late <laughs> three o'clock in the morning gonna butcher the words is basically the interference patterns that are produced by scattered light uh, a computer now has is, is fast enough to sit down and it's just as fa is fast enough to calculate the differences and then then adjust the mirrors slightly uh, to compensate for the dance, for, for the motions of the atmosphere, and this again, this is judged by uh, doing light measurements on a star and looking at the fluctuations in the light in the light curve to determine okay, uh, this twinkling is because of this going on in the upper atmosphere, and they're able to work it out and get a better image out of the uh, star than they would if they hadn't uh, done that uh, sort of the the, the the calculations, the adjustments for the motions of the atmosphere, and particularly the higher layer, higher layer uh, water vapor. That's where that's the sort of thing we're looking at now. So, it, it is bringing in a lot of the the the, uh, the, the atmospheric physics. It's bringing in a lot of the other areas, including uh, astronomy, astrophysics, um, uh, solar astrophysics is coming into this as well because we're looking at the uh, the events, the uh, activity that's going on in the sun, and how. That activity actually impacts the uh, uh, the atmospheric physics here. You know the physics the physics of the atmosphere because you're, again you're dealing with heat, you're dealing with energy, and you're dealing with the disbursement of energy. And the thing is, is how the actions of the sun impact the uh, the upper atmosphere. This is some of the dynamics of physics that, that you actually have to go into, and it is, this is this is what can in many ways makes it interesting because you do have a lot of unknowns that you have to sort of deal with but uh you know that's that's the way things go you know this is if 
if I weren't here, I'd be doing a job. I would be working nine to five and <laughs> you know having a having somewhat of a normal, boring life. But uh, I chose this <laughs> for whatever reason. I don't know maybe because I'm not I'm not a normal person. I couldn't handle a normal a normal life. So, anyways, uh, I think I'm gonna leave this here for now, and I will see. Oh, second editing bay is working now. Finally. And it's in production. It's actually producing something. So, anyways, uh, I'll talk to you more about that in the uh, next segment of uh, Big Bang Theory. I'll be TS Vlog. All right. See you probably tomorrow night. All right. Take it easy. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the next segment of uh, Big Bang Theory. I'll be TS Vlog. Well, as you know by now, this uh, the observation, the atmospheric, uh, atmospheric physics observation has become a regular part of our schedule. And so... We're out here doing our observations again. Uh, well, I am anyway, so. Uh, uh, and this will be like this more than likely for the next four years. This is going to be a major part of, uh, uh, of my life. So, anyways, uh, we give you a time and date stamp. It is just about uh, three hours and 15 minutes into the day of uh, Friday, September 23rd, 2016. Yeah. Uh, it's about 70 degrees outside, just about 69 degrees. Uh, this is the, the issue that I've had talk about before with the uh, difference between Celsius and uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, I went to check, uh, sort of now expanding my uh, view of uh, how systems play across between, because uh, uh, the systems that seem to hit us seem to stretch, stretch across Lake Erie and Lake Ontario and then and end up going out through the St. Lawrence Seaway. But on March, uh, when, terms of when the systems actually form and when they're actually active in our area, it stretches the from Lake Erie to um, to Lake Ontario, basically. So eastern tip, western tip, oh, the western tip of Lake Erie to the eastern tip of Lake Ontario. So went and checked uh, the western uh, edge of uh, Lake Erie. That's essentially Toledo, Ohio. And uh, there's an airport out there that has a, 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 a weather station. And fortunately, I was able to sort of pick that up. It was close enough to the uh, lakefront that uh, it, it should give us a good reading. And I found the similar thing uh, on Lake Ont around Lake Ontario, uh, where it's basically... Uh, southern edge is uh, Buffalo, New York, and again I found a <clears throat> a uh, a uh, airport that has uh, a weather station close enough to the eastern tip of Lake Ontario that now I have a range, a way of sort of calibrating, sort of, not really calibrating, sort of taking a look at seeing, well, okay, what's going on with the weather over there uh, in these particular areas, and because this is where the clouds seem to be uh, uh, significant and the thing is, as I said before, the, it, from what I've seen from the satellite, the, through satellite observation, is that a large chunk of the effect, the lake effect, seems to be in the eastern, in, 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 well, in the east, eastward direction. In other words, it's flowing east rather than flowing west. So, uh, Buffalo, New York, when it talks about the, basically it's south of, it's just directly south of Ontario, that part of, uh, of Buffalo that gets hit, hits with a lot of snow. Well, part of Buffalo will get hit with Lake Erie, the, the, the one that's on the western, one that's on the western edge of uh, Lake Ontario will get hit with the flow from Lake Erie, and there's a, uh, enough Buffalo on the um, on the eastern edge of Lake Ontario that will end up getting uh, the lake effect snow from Lake Ontario because, as I said, it's on the eastern edge. Where do we get? All right, I'm here. Uh, I'm here, in a little north of Toronto. Uh, I'm in a city called Markham. This is just directly above uh, Ontario, and actually uh, Toronto. And actually, considering we're the geographical, it's not just simply north. I'm actually sitting due north of Toronto, and my view here is again due north. I have uh, a directions to where I can see east and west, and uh, if I get up and look around uh, at the building behind me, uh, I can see the southern portion as well. In other words, I have an all direction view uh, for my observation. But anyways, I went and checked the uh, the temperatures to see where, but you know, was there a, a difference? And basically, uh, 
the western edge of Lake Ontario was experiencing uh, 66 degrees and they measured it at uh, basically 19 or 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, we're here at just about 69 degrees, right? And uh, Toledo, Ohio is at 70, 71. But the thing is, is when you look at the Celsius, it's always between 19 and 20 degrees Celsius. It's only like a one, one degree difference. Where in, uh, if you look at the, the 70 degrees in Toledo, Ohio, and the, uh, the 66, 65 degrees in, uh, at, the, at the eastern edge of Lake Ontario, uh, well, that's, that's essentially a, a five degree difference. And actually, that five degree difference does make a difference in terms of how the human body reacts to or feels at the difference in temperature. You know, 70 degrees is comfortable. 65 degrees for many people is cold. So, you know, or we're getting on the cold side of things. This is where, you know, if it's 65 degrees outside, maybe you might want to bring a jacket. If it's 70 degrees outside, that's kind of room temperature. And you're all right. You don't need really need a jacket. You can be out here in short sleeves. That's, you know, I'm out here in short sleeves right now. That's, I'm not wearing a jacket. I had a jacket out earlier because it, there had been a, been a bit of a wind, and the wind produces a wind chill, and that kind of drops the temperature of the body a bit. Uh, and that's why, in many cases, uh, even though it may say, okay, yeah, it's 70 degrees outside, but if there's enough of a wind chill out there, yeah, it, this is where you would end up needing a jacket. Uh, and the thing is, what's the difference in temperature? What, you know, because it is this temperature, the difference like that, what effect, how does this work into the dynamics? And as I said, what happens, you're looking at the thermodynamics of things, and you're looking at the flow of heat. If you see that, that, that Toledo, Ohio, which is not necessarily that significantly south of uh, where Buffalo is, you know, from the western edge uh, of uh, Lake Erie to the uh, eastern edge of Lake Ontario, there isn't much of a difference in uh, latitude. And the thing is, or, or you know, the north-south difference. There isn't that. It's, you know, in other words, the the western edge of Lake Erie is not that far enough south that you say, okay, yeah, you can understand the difference in temperature. So what the difference in temperature represents is really a basically a focus on the dynamic effect that's happening in the local area. So. This is what you're looking at here, looking at the dynamics of the weather in the area, see how it affects the human, the human being, how it affects the human body, and this is where Fahrenheit actually is, actually is superior to Celsius. Now, if you're working on, on chemical equations, right, then Celsius is the one to do. But if you work on thermodynamics, right, you're working on the physics of what's going on, then you're not even using Celsius, you're using, you're using Calvin. Calvin is the scale you want to use. So this is the question here, is, is, is finding the right scales, finding the scales that actually will, will, will produce a difference, you know, if you're doing a graph or something like that, if you're doing a chart and you want to track this thing and you want to look for tr uh, trends in, in, in patterns, then Fahrenheit is the, is, is the best one to do, uh, the best one to use because it gives you the best um, uh, sort of, uh, uh, the best uh, view of things. Uh, that's the way I go, is a view. You're not out far enough so that, the, 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 you know, if you are too, f too far, you don't have enough close enough view, you're only seeing small changes. And there's a chance that you'll miss some more important fluctuations in temperature. But if you get in at the right level, and you begin to see, uh, see that there's enough ticks between the, the degree points, this is where you can start seeing patterns and in, in fluctuations in temperatures, particularly if you're looking at, at patterns in, in these sort of fluctuations. If you're looking for these, this is where you can start to see these. Okay, this is a pattern here, this is a pattern. And you can see how, uh, with the atmospheric physics, how they can relate to different systems that are in the area. So uh, that's kind of where things are going now. I'm sort of expanding things out. But as you see, it's not a, it's not a, <laughs> the uh, garbage trucks just came by, so. Yeah, I'm up with the garbage people. So, <laughs> uh, so this is the sort of the dynamic we're looking at, and this is the length why it takes so long. Is, yeah, I've now got that little stretch there. I've now got to start building a sort of not only a model, but an observation point where I can see uh, on a on on a on a better, uh, not a better, a more imp uh, an improved view, so that I get enough information coming in that I can sort of say, okay, yeah. When this storm came in here, it hit here first, then it migrated to here. You know, I, in other words, I can track storms better and see the effect on the ground 
rather than simply seeing what's going on from the satellite. And that's what that's initially the point was here. Okay, yeah, I'm, I've done it exactly locally here. Take the experience from here, the local observation, and then uh, expand it or extrapolate the experience into a larger survey. And so this is what's happening now. What I'm, uh, I am still in the general survey uh, portion of the atmospheric observation. This is called a general general survey because the the, the research hasn't focused. It hasn't uh, become more specific uh, because there's still a lot of general information that I still need to sort of get a handle on. And it's not it's, it's, it's going to take me one whole, whole one whole year, four seasons. Uh, in each different season to sort of see the, the differences in change, to get a hold of this sort of, uh, 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 this initial focus before I start bringing uh, the research forward into a, uh, a more specific or more focused reader. So basically, uh, it's going to take me a year before I get into the regular portion where I'm repeating or looking for repeat patterns uh, of uh, uh, season per season. Uh, Looking at patterns, let's say in fall, looking for patterns in spring, looking for patterns in winter, looking for patterns in summer. Are there specific differences? Do you see do you see the changeover from summer to fall, uh, uh, from summer to fall, from fall to winter, from winter to spring? Do you see this? Can you track the therm the, therm the thermal inputs and the thermal outputs? You know, and, because this is the whole thing of tracking heat. If you want to track the heat in terms of the thermodynamics, uh, and this is where you'll see global warming or global cooling or whatever is going on at this particular point in time. Right now, I'm not seeing global warming at all. I'm not seeing, actually, I'm seeing what I would consider to be global cooling, that we're seeing a, a breakdown of uh, basically the transport between uh, the, tropical, the tropical system to the North Pole. And the North Pole is starting to grow now. In other words, it's getting cold enough that the activity in the North Pole is starting to grow. And uh, that, to me, me, because of the heat signatures, uh, looks to me like that we're seeing a global cooling pattern. This would match up with uh, what we're seeing on the sun. We're seeing a reduction in activity on the, on the surface of the sun. These things sort of match together. They correlate. And this is what produces our, the understanding, okay, yeah, we're in a global cooling period. And this is what also sort of gives the idea that hey, we need to study the sun more because the sun is actually having an impact on how a, a very specific impact and a very clear impact on where the climate on the earth is going. So if, if you're cooling or heating, you're looking primarily at the sun. Then once you have your primary factors, you look for secondary and, third and tertiary factors to see what might also be affecting uh, the, um, the thermodynamics of the earth, the thermodynamics of the atmosphere. Uh, and that way you can, you know, if, if, if the thermodynamics that, that the human beings do, they are our thermodynamic input, let's say, let's call, use that term, and if our input is significant, we'll see it. If it's not significant, then we're not going to see that impact. We're not going to, it's not going to show up. In other words, it'll only be a, a, a smaller portion of the thermodynamic effect that, the, let's say, the sun has. So the sun is, is, is your primary factor, but how, how primary? Is it 80%, 90%, 95%? Uh, Where is it on that scale there? And then what other factors are there? And how significant does a factor have to be before you say, you know, we need to do something about this? So right now, uh, the thing is, it's not carbon dioxide, it's water vapor. Water vapor is the primary tracking uh, uh, element for uh, thermodynamics, because uh, this is what you see when you talk about uh, the heat in, the, in, in any particular area. You're talking about humidex. Humidex is the humid level of humidity in the air, and that is uh, water vapor. So, And most astronomers know this, because this is why you build your telescopes uh, way up on the mountaintop because you want to get away from the water vapor. You want to get as far up as you possibly can. This is why uh, Hubble was such a great idea because you, because you were you're completely outside of the water vapor. You can do a lot more with astronomy uh, without that atmosphere there than you could uh, with a uh, land-based telescope. It was very difficult to manage. So, anyways, uh, I think that's going to leave this here for now. And I'll talk to you in the next segment of uh, Big Bang Theory's uh, Big Bang Theory of uh, BTS Lock. All right, take it easy.
Welcome. Welcome to the library. And I am a librarian. I am the professor. And professor of what? Professor of physics. Oh, say, can you see? Speech rules here at Democratic Earth.